Song for a Whale, Chapter 41. <clears throat> I tore through downtown Cape Oliver, weaving between the shops and restaurants and tourists. At a small red brick library, I leaned against the wall to catch my breath and check once more on Blue 55. My phone screen showed the battery life with the tiniest sliver of red, like that line from Miss Khan's pen that could ruin everything. Even if I somehow made it to the sanctuary before Blue 55 left, I might not be able to play the song. All that work I put into it and all the distance I'd travel to get there could be worthless because I hadn't plugged in my phone overnight. I'd never forgive myself for that. Nothing I could do about it now. I'd have to just get to the sanctuary and see what happened. Until then, I'd save whatever life the phone had left. I shoved it into my sweatshirt pocket and, and turned in a circle, trying to figure out which way to go. I'd run the way Grandma had pointed from the shuttle stop, but a straight shot wasn't possible with all the buildings in the way. The main street was on a diagonal, so I wasn't sure if I was headed the right way or running parallel to where I'd been. I ran again in a direction that felt right, while picturing the map that Benny had shown us. The sanctuary was farthest down the coast. I knew that much. Finally, I found the beach, but couldn't see the train tracks from here to help me figure out where I was. What if I ran in the wrong direction? By the time I figured it out, I'd be even farther away from Blue 55. I touched the compass on my necklace, tracing the outline of the whale, wishing 55 could somehow show, show me how to reach him. Then I smacked myself on the forehead. What I needed was hanging right there around my neck. I laughed at myself as I unclasped the necklace and opened the compass. Mr. Gunner was right. It still worked. I'd navigate like people did for centuries. The compass needle pointed north. I turned so that, so that north was at my back and ran. When I got close to the sanctuary, I didn't need a map or compass to tell me I'd found the right place. I put the compass in my sweatshirt pocket next to my phone as I ran toward the red roof of a lighthouse. If I got there before the boat left, maybe I could convince them to change their minds about the song. I'd play it for them and show them how easy it'd be to just toss the speaker into the water. It could wait until after they tagged him so it wouldn't interfere with his song as they listened for him. It was okay that I couldn't get on the boat. I'd wait inside the building and watch the tagging on the video screens, or I could stand outside and maybe get a glimpse of him as he swam in the bay. The important thing was that Blue 55 would hear his song. An orange boat that looked like the one in the video from last year when Andy tried to tag 55 was in the water. Ahead of me was a jetty with large rocks on either side like the ones I'd seen in Galveston. That would get me farther into the bay. After a few steps along the jetty, I slowed my pace. Waves crashed over the rocks and splashed onto the surface, slippery with seawater and algae. Twice I fell on the way to the end. The orange boat was ahead of me on the left, heading toward the sanctuary building. Was Blue 55 somewhere nearby, or were they, going to, were they going back because the expedition had failed again? Or maybe they'd already tagged him. When they got close enough, I'd flag them down. I peeled off my sweatshirt and dropped it onto the jetty with my backpack. After the run, I needed to cool off. I started to wave as the boat got closer to me. Then I lowered my hand. Andy and the man behind the wheel were both smiling. Andy held the tagging pole, which no longer had a tracker at the end. The man took one hand off the wheel to give Andy a high five. They were celebrating. They tagged the whale. Blue 55, the reason I was standing there, I'd left home to fly and cruise and ride a train and run to him, and he was gone. I tried to be happy for Andy and her team. They had set out to tag Blue 55, and they had done it. But I couldn't feel happy, not yet. For the first time since I started the trip, I cried. 
It wasn't the kind of cry that was for one thing, but the kind that brings up everything sad or unfair that ever happened. It was possible to miss someone you'd never met. I'd come all this way because I felt alone and thought Blue 55 did too. Alone, even in a crowd. And now he was swimming away from me. There I was, completely alone, standing in cold, wet clothes on a jetty. I thought back to what the captain had said during the fjord tour. Sometimes you have to know when it's time to give up and turn back. I shook my head and wiped my face. No, this couldn't be the end. I wasn't ready to give up yet. Blue 55 hadn't give up after all those decades of singing with no one answering him. If he had, I wouldn't know about him. I wouldn't have been on that cruise ship. There had to be something more to do, some hope to grab onto. Blue 55 wasn't so far away yet. I wouldn't see him up close, but wasn't I doing this for him? Maybe Tristan had been right all along, and I re and I was really doing this for myself. I was the one who was lonely, and I'd wanted wanted the whale to hear me. But right then, all I wanted was to let him know I'd heard him and that he'd connected to someone. The song I'd made wouldn't be exactly like his, but it was as close as I could get. Everything I'd done would be worth it. If just a few notes of the song touched his heart, I'd show him that there was at least one place in the ocean where he could find music like his own. Whenever, wherever he was, he'd still be close enough to hear his song. I grabbed the waterproof speaker from my backpack and plugged the wire into my phone. The red line showing the battery life was thinner than a hair. I tossed the thermos into the water for the song to play as long as it would. If I could catch sight of Blue 55 for a second, I'd have that to hang on to. I'd come for so much more, but at least I'd have something. A glimpse of his back or tail or breath right then would be the hum would be like the hum of radio static against my hand. Even if I didn't feel his music, I'd know I'd gotten really close. I scanned the waters all around the bay, back and forth, frantic. Flat waters with the kind of stillness that must have been quiet. Just let me see you. Let me know this wasn't all for nothing. No, not nothing. I touched the origami whale in my jeans pocket. At least I brought Grandma to see the sea. And it washed away the drizzly November in her soul. She'd navigated her way through her grief. My weird, funny grandma, never content to stay in one place, who knew from the start that I should have a name, that I should have the name of a whale. She'd never be an ordinary grandma. She was the kind who would take your hand and join you on an adventure. Who had to break free like those bubbles trapped under the glacial ice. Life would never be the same without Grandpa, but we'd be all right. And Grandma knew that too. And I'd made a good friend. I'd hoped we'd make it back to the siren before it left port, so I'd have more time with Benny. I missed, I'd missed seeing the whale, this whale who I knew without even meeting him from the first time I learned his name. He'll never know that someone out there felt that way about him. Maybe he wouldn't have to under, maybe he wouldn't have understood anyway, but I would have liked to have told him, I'm sorry. I did everything I'm, I could. I'm here now. Then. I saw it. Out of the waters ahead, a gray-blue whale swimming toward me. Maybe it was another whale. There was no way to tell from where I stood on the dock. But then, a column of spray from the blow spout, the whale's back arched, the crescent of the dorsal fin rose above the surface, followed by the broad fluke. There she blows, and there I jumped.